Hi everyone. In the previous lecture, we discussed what happens if your transfer function h of s, if your system is actually a causal system, and input happens to start at t equal to zero. We showed that if you applied an input of this type e power s naught of t into u of t to an LTI system with an impulse response h of tau, then the output can no longer be written in simple closed form expressions, but rather it reduces to something of this form. So wherein you have an input e power s naught of t multiplied by an integral. Okay, and we said that by making some assumptions, we can try to derive some closed form expressions. And we assume the system containing only poles, and we said that we can express this integral as two terms. The first term being the input multiplied by the transfer function evaluated at s equal to s naught, and this is something we had discussed even in the previous lectures, even without imposing conditions of causality and all that. But there was one difference. You had an additional term. I'm calling it as h n of t, which is more like a natural response of the system, and that was determined by the poles of the system. So this is a function of time where uh, the time dependence comes entirely from the poles of the system. For a stable system, we said that if the impulse response contains will contain mostly decaying exponentials, if all the poles are on the left of s plane, then the impulse response or the h n of t, the term here, will contain only decaying exponential terms. So we can ignore that in the steady state, and the gain will simply reduce to this. So this is simply your frequency response or uh, the transfer from in mean, the typical frequency response of a simple LTA system, okay? Wherein, wherein for an exponential input, the output is simply exponential input times transfer function evaluated at s equal to s naught. Okay. So then we try to derive what happens if the exponent of the exponential signal happens to be a pole of the system s naught equals s p. And we said that in that case. The expression, that expression for the time domain output, can be written as e power s naught of t multiplied by t into u of t with some constant alpha here. Okay, and then there was also some additional term h m of t determined by the remaining m poles, remaining uh, poles of the system. Except, I mean, if you remove the pole s p out of the system here, this h m of t here, which I have written as simply h m of t, it's the response due to all the remaining poles. And we said that in the steady state, if the system is stable, this term will go to zero, because all the all those terms will be exponentially decaying signals, and they will all vanish to zero in the steady state, and you will be only left with this. This is nothing but the input exponential signal e power s naught of t multiplied by t into u of t. So we said that it's as though when you apply a singular input to the system, a singular input meaning your exponent is equal to the pole. This system is going to offer a time varying gain, and the gain will increase linearly with time. Okay, if you have just one pole at s equal to s p, if you have a multiplicity or n such poles at s equal to s p, then the gain will increase as t power n by n factorial. So these are the two things we discussed. Now we will extend a similar argument and see what happens when I apply a zero forcing input of this type e power s z of t. To a system with zero at s z, so h of s z is zero. So we'll impose the same conditions of causality and input starting at t equal to zero. So your input will be e power s z of t into u of t. So then we'll see what is the output. So I'll start with a similar uh, derivation. So which we had carried out in the previous lecture, we assumed uh, for any general transfer function, we derived this result. We said that the expression contained two terms. One. This was the steady state response where the input e, I mean e power minus s z of t into u of t, multiplied by h of, I mean the transfer function evaluated at the exponent of the input, of the uh, exponential input signal, plus a term called the natural response which was determined by the poles of the system. So going by this expression, this is what we said your output should look like. Uh, we have derived it for a pole. But we we can say that okay, it's going to look a very similar way in a similar way for uh, when you apply a zero as well, a system with zeros as well. I'll prob I'll give a more rigorous proof in a few moments, but it should look like that intuitively. So we know in the steady state, the first term will obviously be zero. You'll only be left with the second term, which is more like the natural response due to the poles of the system. Okay, uh, due to the poles, and we'll see in a more in a few moments what will this depend upon.
So the interesting thing to observe here is that in the output, there is no sign of the input e power minus of z of t into u of t. Okay. So in contrast, if you try to compare it with the term for the gain when your input was a pole, I mean the exponent of the input was a pole, then the system's offered gain was really large and that was determining the overall response in the steady state. But if you see here for a zero, there is no trace of the input even for any time. I mean for a uh, for, yeah for any time starting at t equal to zero itself. Okay, the system's output is entirely more or less determined by the poles of the system itself. Okay, so then that obviously makes sense if it's a stable system. Eventually, h n of t will also tend to h n of t will also tend to zero as t tends to infinity because that's going to contain only exponentially decaying terms. So your output y of t will tend to zero. So because your output is now forced to zero. Okay, so I'll try to uh, I mean derive this result for some very simple examples, and then we'll uh, proceed to the more rigorous analysis and try to prove this result. So we'll start with a very simple example. I'm feeding a signal like this e power minus omega z t into u of t to a system of this type one plus s by omega z. So if I feed the signal e power minus s as uh, I mean minus of omega z, which is a decaying exponential, the thing with this signal is that it has a discontinuity at origin. So there is a sudden step change from zero to one. So when I feed this, the first term, of course, it's going to come out as it is. You are going to get e power minus omega z t into u of t. But the second term is a derivative term, one by omega z. Now the derivative also contains a step change, e power minus omega z t into u of t. So I have here shown here the derivative of the uh, the sudden, I mean, the step changed uh, exponential function. U, I mean, e power minus omega z t into u of t. So at, when you differentiate this function, if you see this at the origin, you will have a sudden impulse function. So there is a step change. So der different derivative of a step is going to be an impulse. And then the, the weight of the impulse will be 1. That will be the size of the step. And then you will have a derivative of this function for t greater than 0. So for t greater than 0, it is a continuous function. So this is called, also if you, if you are interested in mathematics, it is called piecewise continuous function. Uh, it's a very, I mean, it's a very, very simple thing, but I just wanted to mention it. So it's a, it's a function. Uh, it, it doesn't have any singularities, meaning it doesn't blow up to infinity at any point in time. But then it has discontinuity at the origin. Okay, so it's a piecewise continuous function. It's continuous for t greater than zero, continuous for t less than zero, but discontinuous only at t equal to zero. Okay, so after that. The, it's a purely differentiable function, so you will have minus 1 by omega z into e power minus omega z t. Okay, so now this is your expression for the derivative of uh, an exponential function with a step at the origin. So you will actually have even an impulse signal, and when you substitute it here, you will simply get the impulse function at the output. So you have fed a decaying exponential function to this system, but what you got here is a simple impulse function of area 1 by omega z. Now we'll try to analyze this by including just one pole into the system and then see what happens at the output. So I can actually analyze this as a cascade of two systems. So I can first assume a system containing just one zero at omega z. So we know that if I fed an impulse, an exponentially decaying signal to this system, I'm going to get an impulse by omega z. Okay. Now if I know, and we already know what will be the impulse response of a single pole system. That is simply, I am going to feed an impulse as an input to this system. So you will get omega p into e4 minus omega p into u of t is the impulse response of that system. So this is nothing but omega p by s plus omega p. So if I find the impulse inverse Laplace transform, I will get this term. That you will have to just divide it by omega z because input is also divided by omega z. Okay, so this will be your expression. So I just split it into two function. In the first problem, we just solved the output for this system we found it to be delta of t by omega z and that we are going to feed it we have split the system as two systems okay and we said that i mean uh, we are trying to say that we can analyze this as a cascade of two systems the analysis becomes simpler so if you observe the output here the output here doesn't contain any trace of e power minus omega z t so it, it's completely that signal is absent but the output is determined by the function e power minus omega p t which happens to be the pole 
So this is what I was trying to say uh, a few moments ago. We said that for if a system is causal and all that, and if I feed an input starting at t equal to zero, you'll get an output, and that output will be determined purely by the poles of the system. So in the steady state, of course, this function is going to go to zero. So this is again that's why we are saying this as a zero forcing input. Okay. The, see here, uh, I mean, in fact, if you let assume for the time being, I'll assume that your pole is at a much much lower frequency compared to zero. Okay. So which means this function is going to decay down much faster. So even though e power minus omega z t, so which means I'll, if I draw e power minus omega z t is like this, and e power minus say omega p t is here, so it's, it's decaying much faster. So even though your input is still finite, your input is still present, your output has actually gone to zero. Okay. So that's what uh, I mean. We should see that's how a zero tries to make a system behave. Okay. So when you feed this input, even though the input is alive and present at the input. At, at the input of the uh, system, the output has gone to zero. So we'll uh, I'll at least try to give a more rigorous proof of this result, which is your output will be the input e power s t of t multiplied by h of s time plus a, a, a response determined by the poles of the system. So to solve this, what we'll do is we'll assume a general transfer function of this type h of s. Is of this type where n of s is a numerator polynomial in S, okay, and d of s is a denominator polynomial in S. So your n of s is a polynomial like this: a naught plus or a naught s power zero plus a one s plus so on plus a n into s power n. So this is a system with m n zeros. So if you equate the numerator with zero, you will get the zeros of the system, and this system has n zeros. The denominator polynomial can be written like this. I have written it here. It has m terms, capital M terms. So the system has m poles. Okay. So I am going to call h h z of t h z of t as the impulse response of the system with the transfer function n of s, and h p of t as the impulse response with the transfer function one by d of s. So this is impulse response due only to the poles. So this is impulse response h z of t is only due to the zeros. So I just have to take impulse. I mean inverse transform of this equation. So that's going to be summed over zero to one, zero to n, a i into delta here i power i t of t here. It this i here represents the derivatives of an impulse. Okay, because we discussed s is delta dash, s square is delta double dash, and so on. So second derivative of an impulse, and so on. Okay, and your h p of t will be one by this. So again, since it's an m-pole system, I can represent it as a sum of m single-pole systems, okay? And uh, all, all the all the poles, all the m poles of the single-pole systems will be the poles of the composite system, the system of of uh, given by one by d of s. So your impulse response can be written in this way: it will contain m terms and m exponential signals e power minus s p i into t. So now your overall impulse response is simply the convolution of the impulse response due to zero and due to the pole. So then, if I convolve these two equations, this with this, then I'm going to call H P as the impulse response uh, due to poles. Then it will simply be written in this way: A I into the derivatives of the impulse response due to poles, H P I of t. Okay, I the derivatives of H P of t. If for so this will be of this form a zero into h p of t plus a one into first derivative of the impulse response due to poles and so on. Okay. So now what we'll do is uh, now that we have split the system into two parts, I'm going to now feed the input to the system with the transfer function n of s. So now the input is e power s naught of t uh, convolved with h z h z into z of t. Okay. And we'll see what happens. So, I mean, if you directly convolve it, uh, I mean, without any constraints on causality and input starting at t equal to zero, we'll simply get this e power s naught of t into n of s naught. And if s naught happens to be a zero, you will get zero. But if I int introduce the conditions of causality and all that, so now first I'll assume your input has a step e power minus s z of t into u of t. That's your input now. If I fed this as an input to the system h z of t, which contains impulses and derivatives of impulse, so of this form, i 
going from 0 to n a i delta dash, I mean delta i of t, where i here is the derivative, the ith derivative of the impulse function. If I substitute it, I will actually get two terms. The first term will be of this type, e power minus z of t into n of minus z. Okay, so which can be very easily derived. We have already done such derivation, so I'll not tell how you got that. So you'd get this term. The second term will be because of the derivatives of the step function. You know, your uh, there is a step at the origin for this function, and that that undergoes many derivatives. So because of which you will have impulses, derivatives of impulses here, multiplied by e power minus z of t. But you should know. Uh, that the first term here will be 0 because n of s minus of sz is simply 0. Okay, So this result can be very, very easily proved. I am not going there. Uh, so I, I, that's why I just left it out, the first part. The second part can also be written, I mean, using this, if you just convolve it with the derivatives of impulse, you will get the second part. The second part reduces to something like this. You have derivative of impulses multiplied by an exponential signal. Then you will be left with, again, uh, since you are multiplying with an exponential signal, uh, if you are multiplying with an impulse, it will be 0 everywhere else. So you can ignore this term altogether. The first term can be fully ignored. Because e power 0 is 1, so you will be left with just this term. So now this, if I feed it, if, if I feed this as an input to a transfer function 1 by d of s with an impulse response hp of t, you are going to get an output which will be derivatives of hp of t. Okay, so you're actually going to get an input of this type. The input is going to be, our output is going to be summed over i equals 1 to n a i into, I've written it as h l of t, which is nothing but integral of your impulse response. It's, it's a slightly different version. So in fact, if, uh, let me write it in a more clear way. You'll actually get a1 h p of t plus a2 h p dash of t and so on. Okay. Uh, there will be one derivative. So if you if you look at the impulse response, that will be of this type, a0 hp of t plus a1 into hp dash of t and so on till a n into the nth derivative of the, the, the impulse response due only to the poles. The difference here is the uh, a1 is multiplied by the first term here. The coefficients are all slightly different. But the important point to understand here is that the output is purely determined by the poles of the system. And if you see here, e power minus sz of t doesn't figure out in the expressions anywhere. So for a stable system, we can say these terms will vanish to 0. For a stable system, hp of t will be 0 as t tends to infinity. So the de derivatives of that will also be 0 and eventually the, out the output of the system will be forced to 0. So to quickly summarize, we just discussed for a singular input of this type, e power sp of t the output is simply going to be some constant times alpha times t into u of t, where there is one pole at sp of t. If you had a multiplicity of n poles, it's going to be e power sp of t into alpha into t power n by n factorial into u of t. So this is, if I ignore the, in fact, there are additional terms added to this, and those terms are determined by the poles of the system. And if I give a zero forcing input of this type e power z of t, then the output of the system will not even contain e power z of t. It will only be determined by the poles of the system, which I'm which I'm writing it as hn of t here. Okay, and we derived a more exact expression of what hn of t will depend upon. It depends only on the poles of the system. Okay, uh, so that's it about zero forcing and singular inputs. I'll now start with. Uh, the, the actual analysis of circuits and how trying trying to find poles and zeros by intuitions.